In the final minute, Bennett from the pocket, launches to the end zone, caught, touchdown, A.D. Mitchell. Keeper, Bennett, gets a block, Georgia draws first blood. But the Georgia Bulldogs bludgeon their way to back-to-back. Glory, glory, Georgia, as the fight song says. Well, we're going to talk about Georgia football now. And talking Georgia football nowadays in college football, there's there's Georgia and then there's the rest of college football. It's basically how it's, it's – it's crazy how it's changed, Jed. Just a few years ago, it was Alabama and the rest of college football. We had Clemson there for a little bit and the rest of college football, and now it's Georgia's turn. The, 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 the big question, though, is how much longer will Georgia be able to sustain this uh, level of uh, dominance, especially with the, the, the transfer portal and all that kind of stuff? Probably not much longer, but – them being a powerhouse and a national contender each season, no, 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 uh, no reason to think that's not going to continue for a while. Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, it depends on your definition of dominance. Like, is Georgia going to win every title uh, for the next decade? No, but like Alabama, what Kirby Smart has done and is doing on the on the recruiting trail has set Georgia up to be one of these perennial uh, power programs. You know, I think the the consensus thought for a long time was Georgia was a um, a sleeping giant yeah. program, of sorts, which sounds silly to say because it's not like they they haven't been successful under Mark Richt or Jim Donnan or guys before that. But but Kirby Smart has taken this thing to another level, obviously with uh, two national titles, played for a third. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's uh, like you said, it's it's as someone who's been around this program for a while, it's a little jarring to to realize that it, like you said, it is Georgia and everybody else right now. Yeah, uh, but but that's certainly how it is. And the biggest difficulty, though, like, like any team is going to have, uh, especially even a dominant program like Georgia right now, is that quarterback spot. Because uh, as we know, football, you just can't win national championships. Rarely you do unless you have something going on at quarterback. You know, you don't have to necessarily be a superstar. That's Bennett proved that. Not a first round, second round pick, nothing like that. But he had all the other intangibles at a very high level that made up for it. So what's George's situation now at quarterback? Are they? Is this going to be a big drop-off for the first year, big questions? Or do you think this might be a little bit more seamless than people think? Um, I mean, I don't think it'll be a huge drop-off. Um, I mean, it, it's Carson Beck, Brock Vandegrift, and Gunnar Stockton, the three kind of battling for it. The, the consensus seems to be it's going to be Carson Beck is, is who the smart money is on. And Beck, listen, he's got all the physical tools. He's got a big arm. He's maybe not as mobile as Stetson Bennett was, but he's mobile enough. Um, he's got all the tools. The question mark with Carson Beck has been throughout his Georgia career has been confidence, right? He came in back up duty some in 2021, didn't look very good. And then last year he backed up Stetson Bennett, and and again you take it for what it is because he's he's playing mop up duty against some lesser teams, but he looked much more confident, more in control of the offense. Um, so he's got all the tools. People you talk to around the program, people that know him, say he's he's turned a corner over the past year. He's much more confident, um, which, which obviously is huge quarterback. But the question is, you know, if if Georgia has a game, say like Missouri last year, and Georgia's down seven on the road in the fourth quarter. Does Carson Beck, does he have the ability to rally a team yeah. and pull him through that? If you're down by 11 or whatever it was in the fourth quarter against Ohio State in the uh, in the playoff, can Carson Beck bring you back? So those are the questions. And and to be honest, with Georgia's schedule, you might not know that until that Tennessee game in November, maybe the SEC championship, or maybe not even until the playoff. So it, that's going to be the question, and I think this could be a situation where you don't truly know how good Georgia is at quarterback um, until a couple months into the season. Yeah, uh, look, major props for scheduling Clemson and Oregon the last two years to open the season. I mean that you, I mean that's just as good as it gets. But I'm sure there are a lot of fans in college football that are looking at the schedule this season and they're going, Oh, come on now. Really? Uh, Georgia. Couldn't you have scheduled somebody in September? 
Well, they, they originally they were going to open the season, I believe, at Oklahoma. Okay. Um, and then with the realignment, because the return game of the, that of the home and home would have been after Oklahoma moved to the SEC, so they had to scrap that series. Um, so that's a little bit of an un- and this happened probably last last summer, maybe. Okay. So at the time, uh, you know, with yeah, how far out these yeah. games are scheduled. Yeah. There, there, there wasn't. I mean, there was a little bit of flirtation, I believe, with BYU. Um, that that could get worked out. So UT Martin is kind of the the one that takes place. But yeah, the schedule. I mean, from a from a fan standpoint, uh, kind of stinks in in uh, September, to be honest. Because it's UT Martin, it's Ball State, South Carolina. Obviously, has gotten some buzz this offseason. That should be an interesting game in Athens, and then uh, you play UAB. So, uh, and you know, all those games are at home as well so it's not like you're going on the road anywhere either so it's definitely not the uh like you said the marquee openers the past two years with clemson and oregon nothing quite on that level at all. yeah and you know and again i'm this is just all accidental and we know that and you just mentioned uh, hands were tied with the oklahoma thing and also it just happened to be during a season when the schedule just worked out the way that it also did where mm-hmm. there's only two like legitimate road games Mm-hmm. On, on the entire schedule and you don't have to worry about a f- like the top three teams right now possibly considered uh in, in the opposite division um but look like i said props to scheduling clemson and oregon not a lot of teams will do that the big schools won't won't they don't like scheduling that st- those types of opponents anymore it's just a freakish luck kind of deal and uh, i yeah, think it's worth it's- pointing out I think if Kirby Smart had his way, it would. I mean, obviously, if we've seen in the past two years, you want that big name week one to to get everybody locked in from day one of fall camp. And not to say that Georgia's not now, but when you've got that big top ten, top fifteen, whatever matchup to point to, it, it grabs guys' attention a lot quicker than knowing, you know, we're gonna have we've got two, you know, an FCS team, a, a MAC team, uh, South Carolina, and then uh, I think UAB's in the American now, so. It's a little different, but that said, I don't expect the way Kirby Smart runs his program. I don't expect there to be any complacency or, you know, sleepwalking through the first part of the season, anything like that. I think they're going to come out, uh, come out firing. Uh, by the way, do we know who they're scheduled with next year yet? Ooh, they open. I believe they actually open with Clemson again. Okay. The, uh, I think they do the the Chick Fil A, you know, kickoff game in Atlanta. Cool. I think. Um, is on the docket for next year. You know, I would think that in the coming years, it's going to take a while, maybe two or three years to, to, to with the schedules and all, especially with the realignment. But I would think that once the playoffs start expanding, that teams are not going to worry so much about scheduling those opponents early. Because if you, you know, now you lose, oh, that could be it. Maybe we have no chance for the national championship with one loss. We're going to have to run the table, even just to have a chance. But now with a playoff system where you have whatever at-large teams, I don't think they're going to worry so much about schedule. And that would be good for the fans. So. Yeah, you'll get a lot more, I think. I mean, it's the same thing with a little bit with basketball. You can schedule these marquee games or, or participate in these huge preseason you know, tournaments and stuff, yes. and if you lose, yeah. it doesn't. And obviously, basketball is different. You play more games, whatever. But it's the same thing. A loss isn't going to kill you, especially if you play a good team, play a good game against a tough team. Um, yeah, definitely not going to kill you. So, yeah, I'm, I'm personally, from a fan standpoint, I'm looking forward to seeing more of those games across college yep. football uh, over the next, you know, five, ten years. Yep, one more year, and then it's uh, we get a real playoff. So that's going to be awesome. Okay. Let's uh, talk about the offense more than just a quarterback spot. So, again, what you're saying is you believe it's a three-man race still, but Beck is the supposed favorite. Mm-hmm. The The backfield, dangerous as ever? Well, uh, if they're fully healthy, yes. The, okay. the, the issue right now, there's some injuries at their running back spot. Kendall Milton is a guy who's battled injuries his, his Georgia career. He is injured right now. He's got a hamstring uh, deal going on. Don't know exactly how serious. Um, he hasn't been practicing fully. You know, he's, he's held out of certain spots. So, you know, hamstrings are weird. So we'll, we'll, yep. we'll see there. Um, Branson Robinson, who, who showed a lot of flashes in as a freshman last year, um, he suffered a, a foot, foot or ankle injury over the summer. He's still working his way back. 
He probably won't be full go week one. And, and even the healthy guys, you know, Andrew Paul tore his ACL in fall camp last oh, year. Okay. So yes, he's okay. quote unquote back, but but with ACLs, it usually takes a while and, and stuff like that. So depth at running back is a little bit of a concern. Just, you know, there's Dejan Edwards is back. He's a very talented player. Paul, like I mentioned, is back. You got a freshman in Roderick Robinson, who, who again is a talented guy, but there's there's, you know, Blitz pickups and a lot of other That's stuff right. that comes with a freshman running back. And then, you know, a guy who's gotten a lot of attention is a walk on Cash Jones, who played a little bit last year. And Kirby Smart has praised him. And he's a guy who can catch the ball out of the backfield, which wow. is, is something wow. Georgia needs. He, I think Kirby Smart has called him like pound for pound, maybe the strongest player on the team. So uh, he, he should be in line for a role, especially early in the year with some injuries. And, um, yeah, I mean, again, I think they'll be fine, but early in the year especially, depth might be a concern. But, again, with how the schedule is, you've got time, Take time to yeah. ease those guys back. Right, You're not, You don't need, to ru- don't need to rush Kendall Milton back from a hamstring injury to play UT Martin at Ball State. So they'll be fine, but, but yeah, it's, it's a little, little uh, probably thinner there than Kirby Smart would like. So, and, and if they're all healthy, is there, is there a, a top prospect – like we've seen in years past, do they have that guy or is it mainly just, you know, maybe uh, like a Macintosh? Yeah. You know, you know, it's James Cook even. Do they have a guy like that even in the backfield? Do you believe? Yeah, it's going to be a by committee thing. I mean, I okay. think they're all, they all have the ability to get, get the hot hand and, and stay in the game. If they got the hot hand, but you mentioned James Cook, like that's and Macintosh. Those are the pass catcher types that, they they don't really have that one guy at least that jumps off the page at you as as a pass catcher. Cash Jones has done that. Okay. Adrian Edwards has the ability to do that. Um, so that's like Andrew Paul had a little bit of, of that last camp before he got injured. But again, how much do you want him doing that coming off an ACL? So that's the question, I think, because James Cook and Kenny McIntosh were were lethal in those roles over the past two years. And I think that's gonna be interesting to see how that sorts out who emerges. Either who emerges into that role, or how does the how does the offense maybe change a little bit, and 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 not having a guy like that. Okay, uh, let's talk about the receivers and Brock Bowers. Th- this is it for Bowers, right? I mean, he's going to play and he's going to be a top ten draft pick. Yeah, I I, I would assume. I mean, yeah. he would have been a top pick after last. <laughs> yeah. Year. Oh, there's there's not a whole lot more you you can accomplish really in college i mean he i mean the only way i think he would want to even come back is if georgia won a title this year and you you somehow talk him into trying to go four for four but but short of of him buying that pitch yeah i I think this is it for a guy who's stepped on campus day one and has just dominated ever since yeah he's uh he's he's i mean I guess you get a, the closest you can compare him to recently is Pitts, really. So, yeah, um, he's just—he's so good. He's got great hands. He's so good after the catch. He's got great. Like he's just—he's fast. He's not fast for a tight end. He's just fast in general. So he's—he's—he's, he's, he's, and and he's got the blocking as, as well. He's just—he's incredible. I mean, he's one of those guys when they throw the fades to him in the end zone, you're surprised when he doesn't catch it. I mean, the yeah. 50-50 balls truly turn into the 7-30-80-20 kind of balls. It's, he's been remarkable to watch over the past couple of years. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, forget top 10, he's, he's, he's probably top 5 material, to tell you the truth. It all depends mm-hmm. on, on, on okay, now it's going to be an interesting quarterback draft, so mm-hmm. that could always push the players down. All right, wide receivers. Now, when I take a look at the team, and I've, and I've got the Arles depth chart popped up here, there are two. There are only two transfers that I see. Now, this could be up. There could be a couple of guys that you can update me on. But as of right now, I see two transfers that would be potentially considered starters on the entire team, and they're both at receiver. Would that be the case? I think Dominic Lovett for sure will be a starter you know the practices we've seen he's running with the first team in, in that slot position um Ra Ra thomas will play he'll be a contributor i don't know that i'd call him a a starter okay um he kind of plays that x receiver position the bigger bigger body type marcus rosemary jack saint is pretty solidified there but again Ra Ra thomas will play 
there's always injuries that could arise I mean, on top of that. So Georgia likes to rotate their receivers in and out a lot. And, and Rob Ra Thomas definitely factors into those plans. Otherwise, they wouldn't have, have pursued and gotten him out of the transfer world. Okay. And, of course, Led McConkey, McConkey, he is the man. Uh, so what – how do you – you know, he's, he's been around a few years as well, been in a lot of big games. Um, what kind of pro do you think he's going to be? And I'm not asking as a scout, obviously, but you've seen football. So what, what kind of pro do you think he might be? The easiest thing is to say he's just going to go to the Patriots and, and <laughs> yeah, be a right. Hall of Famer. So, yeah. um, no, he's, he's – look, he's really tough. Um, he, he just gets open, man. I mean, he gets – He's. I wouldn't necessarily say he's a, a super burner, but he's got good speed. He's shifty. He's got wiggle. Um, he's he's obviously not super big. Um, I know he's had some some knee issues in the past, and I don't know that it's you know one of those things that's going to make him fall off a team's board. But it could make you think twice about taking him in a, in a higher round. But um, he's he's just a football player. I mean, he's he's. I don't know that he'll go blow up the combine like some of these other Jordan yeah. guys have, but when you get him on the field again, he's just a savvy football player. He gets open. He, he's a great route runner. Um, and yeah, he's just, he's a really good football player and has been one of the, like everyone talks about the walk on story that Stetson Bennett was and rightly so, but Vlad McConkey came out of nowhere. Georgia swooped in and offered him at the 11th hour as a, as a high school, as a high school prospect. And he's come in and just, and been so solid the past couple of years. So I think a team's going to give him a shot. And absolutely, you know, he's, he's done well in Athens. There's no reason to think he couldn't do it in the NFL. Yeah, I can see that completely. Okay, are there any uh, young uh, receivers that will be the next wave? Do we have a, a young freshman or just someone in particular, maybe not this year, but next year for sure, that we need to keep an eye on? Um, we've heard some good things about Yazid Haynes this fall. He is a guy uh, – now, he, you know, Yazid, Yazid Haynes has got the speed, a really fast guy. Georgia uh, flipped him from Penn State last year. Um, heard some good things about him. He could contribute even in the return game this year. Anthony Evans, another really fast guy. Um, trying to think of guys in that freshman class um, from last year. I mean, there's just so much experience at that position – Right now, I mean, Jackson Meeks is a guy who's been around forever, and he's one of those guys that's always on the bubble of you, you think he could transfer out and get more playing time, and he never does. He just sticks around. So he could be in line for a bigger role next year. Um, but Haynes is the guy that sticks out the most to you. Haynes is the guy that we, we've – especially going back to the spring too. Like he, he generated some buzz in the spring, and he's again, he's got speed. He's got moves. Okay. Um, probably about six foot, six foot one, about like Ladd McConkey's – height and size so just off the top of my head so that's a guy to be on the lookout for next year as a breakout because there's a, there's a lot i mean roseby jack saint is gone mcconkey's gone love it i think could be gone could be gone to the nfl so um it could be a very different look at receiver next year it's gonna, it's gonna be a lot of playing time up for grabs you know come next spring tight end as well so yeah with bowers and you yeah. know oscar delp is a guy we actually talked to him last night and he's he came in the peach bowl for uh, Darnell Washington, and he's like, I had no idea. Or he just said he felt really small. He's added about 15 pounds this offseason. He's, I mean, what Washington did as basically a a sixth offensive lineman on the field, and it opens up a lot of things for the offense. So Delp has embraced that role a little bit. Uh, obviously, he's a very good route runner, good hands, um, but has embraced the kind of blocking side a little bit of it a little bit too. And then Lawson Lucky and Pierce Sperling, two guys they brought in. Uh, this year, better freshman this year. Lucky had a great spring. Sperlin was out with the spring for an injury, but he's got, I mean, he's probably, I think he's six foot seven, oh. and about 240 pounds. I mean, he's, he is, is a really big, really big dude. So those two are, are definitely, and, and Georgia coaches have mentioned this in press conferences, like them getting to learn from Brock Bowers every day. Oh, yeah. Is yeah. going to be huge for them, you know, the next year or two. Well, it all starts uh, in the trenches, and no reason to believe that Georgia isn't going to have a top-rated offensive line again, correct? Yeah, I mean, most of the offensive line is 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 back. I mean, Cedric Van Pran is back at center. Xavier Trust, Tate Rattler at guard. Um, you know, Amarius Mims wasn't a, a starter at tackle last year, but he played a lot. Like, he played in every game, played multiple series, started the last two games in place of Warren McClendon. So, uh, he... 
might as well be a returning starter. Left tackle is the one you got to replace. Right now, it looks like redshirt freshman Ernest Green is, has got the inside track there uh, to start. And you've got a, a swing guy in Austin Blasky. You can play tackle, can play guard, can play center. Um, I think depth is, is maybe a little bit of a – or is for sure a concern. Kirby Smart has mentioned tackle depth has a little bit of a, a worry, which, again, in a, in a perfect world, right, you, you, you roll your five guys out there and they play every snap – in every game, but that doesn't happen on the offensive line, right? Guys get rolled up and that's right, and whatever. So that's gonna be a thing is is figuring out the depth. You know, I think Kirby Smart mentioned in one of his press conferences he feels like right now he's got seven or eight guys who can play winning football on the offensive line, and I think he wants that number to get closer to nine or ten. Sure, like here just to have that depth, and then obviously look looking forward to next year too. You're gonna have to replace a lot of these guys. Uh, is would Freeling is he the highest rated recruit on the on the offensive line? Uh, probably highest rated. Definitely, probably the closest uh, to playing. Okay, as, as a freshman, you know, if if it came down to it, I don't think he's you know unseating anybody as a starter or anything. But I don't think it's inconceivable that you see him on the field at some point this year due to injury because he. He came in in the spring and added a lot of weight. You know, as a recruit, he was one of these tackles that's like 285, 290. And then once he gets on campus, he's up to about, I think, 310, 315. So he, he's added some good weight. He's very athletic out there. So that's a guy who could get some action this year and then could be competing for maybe that right tackle spot next year. Uh, before we switch over to defense, is there, would you consider Haynes or another player, another freshman that? may get some playing time this year that more than just let's throw him out there for a few snaps offensive freshman um i would say i would say two names i'd say lawson lucky at, at tight end you know i told you before we came on he had a, an ankle yep ankle injury so he, he'll have to come back from that see how that goes but he, he just had a lot of buzz this spring and you know oscar dell kind of worked his way into things toward as last year went on, I think Lucky could do the same. And then Roderick Robinson at running back, like we mentioned, there's a little bit of depth issues there. Injuries always crop up at running back. So I mean, Roderick Robinson is he's like six listed at six foot, about 235, 240 pounds. I mean, he is a big dude uh, for for opposing teams to tackle in the fourth quarter. So I think he could be, you know, carve out more and more of a role for himself as the year goes on. Too. Okay. Let's now switch over to the defense, and this is uh, just as big, of course, if not bigger uh, of a reason why Georgia has won back-to-back championships. The depth a couple of years ago was just unreal. Uh, lost a little of it last year, still came back strong. Lost a little bit more of it again. That's, that's college football. So how does the defense look now compared to the last couple of years? I think they... I think they return maybe a little bit more than people think. Like, okay, you lose Jalen Carter from the defensive line, and he was obviously you know top ten pick. He was disruptive, whatever. But you also return a ton of experience, of veterans, guys that know what they're doing, guys that are that are grown men, right? That are 22, 23 years old. Um, inside linebacker, you return Javon Dumas Johnson and, and Smile Mondin. You know, secondary, Malachi Starks is back. Kamari Lasseter is back. Javon Bullard, who won MVP of both of the playoff games, is back. So, um, you know, there's some big names gone. Carter, Keely Rinko has gone. Chris Smith, who was in trench safety, is gone. But I also think there's a lot of experience and talent back that when, when you kind of take a step back a little bit and look at the at the whole, the, the sum of the thing, it uh, I mean, it's shaping up to be, honestly, it could be, maybe better than last year's closer to that 2021 group. Wow. Just everything they've got coming back. Okay. Well, let's start uh, starting the secondary. You mentioned Bullard. So who would be, would Bullard be considered the leader of the secondary? Uh, Yeah, I would say so. I mean, he's, he's a vocal guy. He's kind of stepped into the spotlight a little bit. Um, You know, he, it's interesting. He was, he was the star position last year, kind of the nickel, whatever he, they're moving him to safety. So it's a little bit different role for him. Okay. But it's, it's one that I think he's just such a, a havoc creator. I think he's going to be, he can make plays at safety just as easily as he can at star. So it's a new role. One he's having to, to learn through the spring and, and through the summer and into the fall, but 
no reason to think there will be any drop off uh, from Javon Bullard. Okay, and then uh, as far as the rest of that group is concerned, who are the who are the top guys? Who 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 has potential on Sundays? I think Kamari Lasseter is a guy. You know, I've seen some first round or some mocks with him towards the back half of the first round. Um, he kind of got overshadowed a little bit by like he Ringo last year, just with the fame he generated from the the pick six in that national championship against Alabama. But Lasseter was rock solid, and the thing about Lasseter is he's not afraid to come up and, and hit you in the run game too. He's a very physical corner. So, um, you know, he he appears to have one corner spot kind of locked down. Okay. And the, and the Malachi Starks, you know, he burst onto the scene as a true freshman and started, I think, every game but the season opener maybe and played played really well for most of the year. So year two, another year in the defense, another year older, wiser, bigger, stronger, faster. So, uh, you know, this the secondary, again, like you lose two starters, but – it could be really good if you think of a year better Malachi Starks, a year better Kamari Lassiter, Bullard back at safety. And then at star, you know, you got Tyke Smith, who's played a lot of football. Um, you know, there's there's a freshman, Janelle Aguero, that's played some star that we've heard some good things about. So, um, yeah, that secondary could be – I mean, at a certain – there's a, a cer- certain uh, floor in a Kirby Smart secondary, right? Like, they're, they're always generally going to be pretty good with that kind of defensive – Defensive bad coaching staff, uh, but this one this one could be really good. Okay, uh, moving on to the front seven. So, uh, the team, as you mentioned, you know, NFL draft has seen some really big time talent from this front seven uh, over the last two draft cycles. Who's the next guy? Do they have a next guy? Do they have a next? Right now, if you looked at it, is there like, oh yeah, this guy's either definitely first round material or definitely top 10 material. Honestly, I don't know if they have a, a top 10 guy right now. I mean, or, okay. I take that back. Michael Williams is, is the guy, you know, if you look towards that five tech defensive end pass rusher position, he's the guy who could be just a freak. He, he had, he had several sacks last year. He had a sack uh, against Ohio state and uh, I get CJ Stroud on a big third down. He, he's long, he's big, he's strong. He has got everything you want in a in a pass rusher. You know, I think if we're talking about the NFL, he's, he's probably like a 4-3 defensive end down the line. Um, but he is that guy. He is the star, I would say, going into a sophomore year. But there's so much, you know, when you look at Nazir Stackhouse, Zion Logue, Tramel Walltower, um, Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, there's just so much football has been played by those guys that they're, they're not going to blow you off the page. They're not necessarily even the game records that a Jalen Carter was, but what they are is they play smart football. They're sound they're They know their assignments and they're, they're going to be a really fundamentally strong group. I think. Okay. Uh, even without that one, again, just terror in the middle of the defense necessarily. Okay. Um, what about linebacker? So how is that looking right now? Yeah, so inside we've got uh, Jamon Dumas Johnson and Smile Mondin back. Now, Smile Mondin is dealing with a foot injury that he suffered toward the end of spring practice. He's still working his way back from that. So he's not, he's probably going to miss the first few games, but there's a ton of maybe not even experience, but talent behind him. You know, Xavier Story is, is a really, really athletic guy like Smile Mondin who hasn't played a ton, you know, in a defensive settings, like special teams and stuff. But, you know, that's a guy that's in. Uh, there's freshmen from last year, whether it's C.J. Allen or uh, Troy Bowles has worked there. Um, you know, E.J. Lightsey is a guy who's, in, I think, going into his redshirt freshman year. So there's a lot of options. That Jalen Walker played a lot last year in kind of an inside-outside hybrid role. Okay. Uh, is, is back with the inside guys. So there's a lot of talent they're just maybe not a ton of game experience especially running with the first team um but again i think with how the schedule i hate to keep keep coming back to it but with how the schedule is you got to figure out who mixes and matches best uh, along with jamon dumas johnson who seems you know kind of kind of entrenched right there as as one of the inside linebackers you mentioned did you mention a player named bowls troy bowls yep okay i don't see him on the depth chart is he a freshman Yes, he just came in. He he arrived in the summer. There you uh, go. He just got okay. to campus a few weeks ago. Um, so obviously that makes you think 
he might be behind some of the guys who enrolled in January, but but he's got a lot of talent. Son of, of Todd Bowles, the NFL coach, so you know he's smart. Ah, okay. Um, so he could be a guy that maybe later in the year he comes on as he picks up the defense more and more. And he's a linebacker? Yes. Okay, cool. We'll add him to the list. Okay, so then uh, let's talk about the this particular recruiting class. I mentioned offense, so the, the defense – seems to be where most of the top guys from your recruiting class is. Is that the case? And if, if so, uh, give me a couple of guys, a couple of freshmen that could be making a little bit of an impact. Like you said, hey, Malachi, Malachi Starks made a huge impact last year. I mean, um, yeah, Malachi Starks made a huge impact last year as a freshman. So can we see a player do that this season uh, on defense? Um, I think if you look on the defensive line, you know, Jordan Hall, is a guy who has generated some buzz. He's kind of a a a you know more of an interior defensive line that can move outside. He's very athletic, very versatile. Um, that's a guy who can make some noise up front. Linebacker, honestly, I think it'll be hard for any of those the inside guys anyway to break through. Now outside, you've got some talented guys. There's Damon Wilson out of Florida has generated a lot of uh, you know a lot of positive buzz. Gabriel Harris is a guy who, who looks good. Um, and in the secondary, you know, I think if a freshman is going to break through, it's going to be at that corner spot opposite Kamari Lassiter. Um, A.J. Harris could be a name to break through there. He was, he was one of the top secondary recruits in the country last year. Um, you know, Jan- Janelle Aguero could make some noise at star. Um, you know, he's, he's one of these guys that will come down and absolutely crush you uh, in, the, in the run game, coming across the middle, whatever. So, um yeah, I, I would. Okay. I'd say those guys are the ones who could be could make an impact at some point. And who would did it? And the top overall prospect who was that this past year? Was it Harris? Twenty. Uh, ooh. Um, trying to think for rivals, it might have been. I mean, it wasn't Harris. Damon Wilson was a five star. Okay. Uh, Samuel and Pimba, another edge rusher, was a five star. Oh, I think he's a little bit more. Uh, raw than maybe Wilson is. So that's why I mentioned Wilson ahead of him. Okay. Um, yeah. All and, right. you know, all the, you know, the, the Georgia is, is they're going to get the, or Jordan Hall ended up a five star by the end of it. So that's a guy, and especially with, with, you know, I think the outside linebackers are, are interesting because Georgia needs to try to generate that pass rush, right? And Nolan Smith is gone. Robert Beal is gone. So there's kind of some, some spots up for some playing, some reps up for grabs there. So any one of those freshmen honestly could break through those outside linebacker pass rusher types. You mentioned that this could be this defense could be as good as the twenty one defense. So, is that does it have as much experience as the twenty one defense? I don't know that it's possible to have as much experience as the twenty one defense, but no, they they do have a lot. I mean, Dumas Johnson and Mondin were your linebackers through most of last year. All these guys along the defensive line have got, you know, two or three seasons of like meaningful reps under their belt. Um, Lassiter started, I think, every game last year. I mentioned Starks earlier. Yep. Bullard's played a lot. Um, you know, there's there is a lot, and again, even the guys who aren't who haven't started, like Tyke Smith, wasn't necessarily a starter last year, but has played a lot. Played at star, um, has worked at safety some in practice, so he's played a lot. Um, you know, Chaz Chambliss, an outside linebacker, hasn't been a starter, but has played a lot of football. There's a lot of guys who have played a lot of football. Yep. Um, so yeah, I mean, experience again, I don't know that it matches the 21 defense with all that they had, but it's, there's a lot, again, I think there's more experience on that defense this year than, than I think people might think just, just briefly looking at it. Okay. Uh, give me a couple more before I let you go. Give me a breakout player on both sides. Somebody Ooh, that breakout player. Yeah. Somebody um, that could uh, make the big, uh, Hey, I don't know who that guy is. And then all of a sudden on the national stage. I mean, offense, the easy one is is Carson Beck, right? Because I just think he's got the talent around him. He's got the confidence now that I think he could have. I mean, if George is going to win the national championship again, he's going to be a big reason why. Just like you said earlier, you got to have good quarterback yep. play. So offense, I'll, I'll cop out and go Carson Beck. Um, defense, I honestly might go Kamari Lester because, again, I think okay. he's a guy – 
He was in Keely Ringo's shadow a little bit, but he is a very good corner that I don't think a lot of people know. So I think he could be that guy who who breaks out and has a really good year and gets a lot of a lot more you know national recognition and stuff like that. Uh, what do you think uh, is going to happen to this year's team? What's your prediction if you have one? I think, I mean, you know, it, it's so hard because you, it on the top of your head, you're like, there's no way a team's going to go 12 and 0 for the third straight year. And then you look at it game by game and you think they're, they're like, there's no game that you would pick them to lose individually. So um, I'll say they'll go 12 and 0. I say they make the playoff. And then honestly, playoff, I think it depends on matchups. I mean, I think if they match, I would like Georgia in a matchup against like a team like Michigan. I think Georgia is, is set up well to beat a team like Michigan that, that wants to, to run the ball and kind of pound it down your throat. You know, I, Ohio State came within a field goal of beating them last year. If Ohio State gets good quarterback play with their, you know, they're replacing CJ Stroud as well. So they could be a team that could upend Georgia. I personally, I think. USC and Caleb Williams would be a scary matchup just because he, like C.J. Stroud, could have the game of his life and, yep. and really get things going. So that's I know right. people say USC is not built in the trenches and the defense, and that's very well could be true, but I still wouldn't wouldn't want that matchup if I was a Georgia fan. So, um, But again, you might not know how good you truly are until the playoffs, until you, until you get in that scenario, and then that's when the questions are going to be answered is – is this team good enough to yes. to pull itself out of the fire and three feet again? So. Yeah, because they're now going to have to. They might be very talented, but now they're going to have to make their own names. They're going to have to right. now be their own star. They're, they're, they haven't. These guys haven't proven themselves as we're the man. We're we're first string. Exactly. Yeah, and, and nobody knows until yep. they play the game. And look, like you said, Ohio State put what forty. Points, 40, 41. Yeah, 41, I think, yeah. So. And if that could happen, like you said with Caleb Williams, yeah, I mean, that's very possible. So I, I, I hear you. That, that's, that's, a, that's a guy that you'd want to stay away from. Mm-hmm. If there was exactly. a, if and there and was again, a like, game. you know, if, if you're Georgia, you, you think you go into that game saying we can dominate them up front, make them one-dimensional, get after Caleb Williams. And, and that might be true. Like, I wouldn't – I don't know that I would pick USC to beat Georgia if they played a national sure. championship game tomorrow. Yeah. But you know, with the skill talent and with Caleb Williams, there's that's a scary scenario for for anybody. I would think so. Uh, do you think that, that that Tennessee game is that like the toughest game on the schedule? I would say so. Um, they play Ole Miss, I believe, the week before in Athens, and you know Lane Kiffin is always a a scary guy. He's, he's got good talent. He's he has slain the dragon before you know he's he's you worry about that game being a trap game more than anything else um but being in Athens I think Georgia gets through that and yeah Knoxville listen Knoxville is crazy not Tennessee wants revenge for last year I mean that's that's the game that this whole season's pointing towards because the thing is if Tennessee goes into that game with one conference loss and upsets you then oh yeah your, your conference championship game and then with the schedule, yep, your best win would be maybe I mean, Florida, Miss maybe? or Auburn, probably maybe Florida. Yeah. So then you get into that scenario of are you eleven and one, and you you miss out on the playoff. Now on the flip side, is the committee going to keep out the two time sure defending champions with with one loss to a team going to SEC title game? I don't yeah. know. I mean, that, there's a lot of other stuff. A lot of it would depend. College football, that would sort that out. But that's the one that your your entire season might hinge on. But I think, you know, Tennessee's got to replace a lot. Joe Milton is, is for me, still kind of in prove-it mode of, of can he lead a team to a championship. I agree with that, yeah. So, again, if Georgia, if that game in Neyland was tomorrow, I would pick Georgia uh, to win it. So. You'd have to because um, uh... – they, they've lost a little bit as well, Tennessee. So, especially the quarterback situation. I agree. I don't know. Milton's definitely improved a little bit, but he's going to have to make big strides uh, all the way through right. the season, letting, leading up into that game to, to prove to me that and anybody else that, yeah, he's a different quarterback because he hasn't had a big enough window for me to see that. I just, I'm a Michigan fan. So, I, 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 gotcha. I, I he, he was so overrated and, and, and he was not good early in his Tennessee career either, as you know. 
So yeah, and the thing is, I mean, he could, and again, Hendon Hooker, you know, when he left Virginia Tech, no one thought he was going to be a, a Heisman finalist or whatever. That's so true. Joe could get into that system and, yeah. and be fantastic or yep. be even better. We just we don't know yet, but based yep. on what we know about Joe Milton, I'm going to need to see him prove it against. You know, I know they've got that stretch. They play A&M, Alabama, and I think Kentucky all back-to-back. So I need to see him prove it. <laughs> there you go. I need to see him prove he can do something other than throw the ball really far. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Before, you know, we, we, we really start thinking about Tennessee as, as you know, a team that could upset Georgia come November. Yep. Well, hopefully, if all goes well, we'll have the opportunity to talk. Because, you know, that, that might be the game that we, we talk. Uh, because, mm-hmm. again, based on the schedule – um, I guess maybe Florida, if possible. Maybe, uh, yep. We've got to see if Florida is undefeated at that point, though. We've got to see if they're a different uh, program. Uh, it's possible. Uh, but I thank you for your time, as always, Jed. And again, we've got the links in the description area for anybody that wants to check out your coverage and uh, your own podcast. Do you have something going on right now? No podcast. Uh, we do a a. Well, we do a weekly YouTube show about Georgia recruiting on the UGA sports.com YouTube channel. There's a lot of Georgia football content there. If y'all want to check that out. And um, yeah, just what's it called? You know, that's, it's uh, the recruiting show is rumors versus facts. Oh. And then, but again, there's all kind of recruiting coverage, team coverage, all that stuff on the uh, UGA sports.com YouTube channel. And that's uh, once a week you do that on YouTube. Yep. All right, we'll put a description in there as well so you can check that out. And Jed, uh, again, I hope uh, we get the opportunity to talk later this season. Absolutely, anytime.